This is the Biz News Podcast, one-on-one conversations with experts in business and personal development. Inflation is prominent in the news these days, but the Federal Reserve sees it cooling quickly. At least that's the median projection by the Fed's Board of Governors at their meeting in mid-December. So is too much emphasis being put on inflation? We have as our guest one of the nation's top economists, Murray Sabrin, Emeritus Professor of Finance at Ramapo College of New Jersey. As you will see and hear, he has some very strong opinions about the Fed and its role in the economy. Does the uh, current level of inflation mean we're in for a recession, a popping of that so-called everything bubble? Give us your thoughts. Well, Doug, uh, this has been going on since the Federal Reserve was created. They keep on inflating the supply of money. The money supply goes up, prices go up. Then they get worried about uh, prices running away and they cut back on the growth of the money supply or even deflate the money supply. And that uh, causes inflation to decelerate. And it gives us the the, uh, recession that we've seen for the past 100 plus years since the Federal Reserve was created. So there's nothing new here, what's going on. The question that everyone has is how long will this inflation cycle last? To give you some historical perspective, the last time we had an inflation cycle, it lasted about 16 years from 1965 to 1981. It was, if you look at the chart of the CPI, it was sort of a stair-step increase from uh, the 1% during the early uh, Kennedy-Johnson years to where it ended in 13% in, the, in uh, I think, the first year of the Reagan administration. So inflation can be a very insidious uh, economic phenomenon because the policymakers at the Federal Reserve think that they know how to micromanage the economy through their uh, toolkit, which is open market operations and uh, and, uh, targeting the Fed funds rate. So when you put all that together, what it means is that uh, central banking is really another form of central planning. And we know central planning does not work. I mean, it hasn't worked in any country where it's tried. The the evidence is overwhelming from a a practical point of view, from an empirical point of view, and from an a theoretical point of view. So the same thing with central banking, Doug, it just doesn't work to achieve the goals of sustainable prosperity. We have prosperity over the long term because of entrepreneurs, the great men and women who innovate, who create, who invent. They're the ones with the capital at their disposal to give us the economy we have today. And the Federal Reserve, unfortunately, is a layer on that economy, which gives us these booms and busts. But isn't the thought of having the Federal Reserve or some other entity uh, kind of overseeing things to act as a buffer to big booms and big busts? Well, that, that, that's the interesting point. If you look at a free market economy, I dare anyone to reveal how you're going to get an unsustainable boom. It's just not going to happen. What you may have is a boom in a certain uh, sector of the economy because of speculation that this is going to be the next great thing and we all should pile our money into it. But as a general boom, it's not going to happen because you don't have the interest rate being manipulated by any central authority. Remember, interest rates, for, for to a simple definition, is the price of money, what it costs to rent money, if you will. And so let the market decide what that price should be based upon supply and demand, the, the supply of savings available and the demand for people who want to borrow money, whether it's for commercial loans, whether it's real estate loans, whether it's for um, uh, consumer loans. Let the market decide interest rates just as the market decides the price of all goods and services. So interest rates should not be immune from the law of supply and demand in a free market economy. So uh, essentially, then, the the politicians in uh, Washington do have uh, a pretty heavy foot on either brake or accelerator. I kind of thought our economy was so big that these guys would just be kind of rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. Well, there are several components here. I love to talk about this, uh, Doug, because it really gives people, I think, a perspective that they won't find anyplace else. We have several economies in the United States. We have the market economy where we all participate with uh, our labor, with our uh, uh, entrepreneurship, with our consumption. That's the beauty of the American economy, entrepreneurship, the free enterprise system. Then we have government spending. 
And we know what government spending does. It takes money out of the pockets of people to spend on things that the pub, uh, public uh, legislatures vote upon. So that's another aspect of the economy. And then you have the regulatory aspect of the economy where they put, put on these uh, onerous regulations on business and they have to comply with that, that increases their cost of doing business. Then the next layer is what I talk about in my book, navigating the boom bust cycle, is the monetary layer, which distorts the economy by giving us these booms and busts that otherwise would not occur because they manipulate interest rates. And if we, there was no manipulation of interest rates, there's no way you can generate an unsustainable boom. It's just impossible. What uh, prompted you to write this book? Well, uh, interestingly enough, uh, two years ago, exactly two years ago, I was contacted by the acquisitions editor of Business Experts Press, who was given my name by a longtime friend of mine who's written several dummies books on investing. And so we talked about uh, what books would you be interested in writing? And I had made the decision back then to retire. So I figured, hey, this would be a nice thing to do in retirement. And we talked about the boom bust cycle because in 2019, my book on the Federal Reserve was published with a very provocative title, Why the Federal Reserve Sucks. It causes inflation, recession, uh, bubbles, and enriches the 1%. And so from that book, I said, we are in another super boom cycle, and I'd like to write about it, gearing it toward the business community, entrepreneurs, what they need to know in order to survive and thrive during the boom bust cycle. So that was the first proposal we put together. The second one is on medical insurance and how business people need to navigate the medical insurance maze that they face because it's such a big component of their cost, whether it's a small company or a large corporation. So I'm writing that book right now, uh, called, uh, and I, the tentative title is Navigating uh, the Medical Insurance Maze. But the Navigating the Boom Bus Cycle, I think is the most important book I could ever write to the business community for college students, for MBA students, for small business owners, for CEOs and CFOs who really wanna get a handle on where the economy is, what uh, landmarks they should look for, for where we are in the cycle, and how they can, um, how they can avoid the pitfalls of, of being caught up in the ex irrational exuberance, to use a phrase from Alan Greenspan from the 1990s during the dot-com bubble, because it's very easy to get caught up in these uh, enthusiastic periods, overexpand your business, overextend yourself, and before you know it, uh, you've got debt, and then, and then the recession hits, and then you are in deep, deep trouble. Uh, but the good news is that if you're astute enough to know where we are in the cycle, you could take measures, which I outline in the book, that would allow you to even uh, become a stronger, more prosperous business when the, uh, when the uh, recession hits and we, we go on another upswing. So as long as the Federal Reserve is around, Doug, we're going to have these boom bust cycles. And that's why this book, I think, is pretty timeless because uh, it's going to be applicable this decade and uh, future decades because, uh, as they say, more things change, the more things stay the same. Now, we have taken the battery out of your uh, crystal ball. So this might be an unfair question. <laughs> what, when do you see the current uh, boom bust cycle heading to Bustville? Well, I just wrote about it this uh, for Fortune magazine. They posted it online um, last week, I believe it was. Yeah, uh, last week. And again, it really depends on how aggressive the Fed is in, um, in uh, cutting back on its um, uh, money supply growth and, um, and what they do with interest rates. They already announced that they will uh, raise interest rates three times next year. The question is how high will they uh, raise it because we know inflation will accelerate next year. The Federal Reserve created $4 trillion of new money last year. They increased the money supply by 25%. That's an enormous increase in the money supply. Therefore, there's a lot of pent up demand in the economy. There's a lot of money sloshing around the economy. We see the housing market on fire all across the country. Prices are going up by 20, 30% in some communities. Uh, um, consumer good prices are going up left and right. And we're seeing a real inflationary problem. Now the Fed is behind the curve. If inflation accelerates to close to double digit rates next year, the Fed may really throttle back. And I think we could have a recession in 2023 because one of the indicators I follow that I discuss in the book is the inverted yield curve when short-term rates go above long-term rates. And historically, when the yield curve inverts, that means the Fed is very tight with, uh, with money creation and, uh, and we're we would see a recession somewhere around a year after that phenomenon occurs. 
So I watch the yield curve. Everyone seems to be watching the yield curve uh, nowadays. Another indicator I look at is the unemployment rate. Because if you look at the unemployment rate, when it reaches these low levels that we have right now, or maybe a bit lower, and then sort of flatlines and goes sideways for several months, and then starts increasing, that means businesses are shedding employer, employees because they see their sales are going down. And that typically indicates that the recession is in the initial months. Now, some demographers see the current labor shortage as something that will be naturally cured as members of Generation Z uh, mature, move into adulthood, and continue their begin and continue their careers. What are your thoughts on that? That that's an interesting uh, point about uh, about demographics and the economy. Uh, I've seen some data that show that there is a a correlation, uh, whether it's causation or not, is another story. A correlation between the uh, labor participation and the economy and, and the growth in the economy. But I look at strictly from an economic financial point of view, and of course, demographics is part of the economy, so you can't discount that. But uh, right now, I'm part of the baby boom generation, the first wave of the baby boomers who were, who were born in 1946. Um, probably most of them have retired by now if they, uh, unless they there's some compelling reason for them to work and uh, I consider myself still employed because I'm writing so uh, even though it's not a full-time job or uh, I'm working for an employer it's still a freelance uh, uh, situation so again baby boomers have retired they're drawing down their uh, 401ks their IRAs and so uh, that's adding supply to the uh, to the stock market but um Again, I haven't done a lot of research in this area, so I'm really not the best person to speak to about that, that correlation and causation. But again, from my perspective, it, the, real, the real key is, is what new products, what new innovation, what innovations are taking place in the economy. And we saw the 70s was a, was a decade of very little economic innovation. It's really in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s where we've seen an explosion in innovations and the economy has done relatively well, uh, despite the dot-com bubble and the housing bubble. And now what uh, I call and other people call the everything bubble, where everything's inflated. I mean, it's just amazing how prices have increased in the last uh, 12 months, 18 months. And so I think we're, gonna, we're going to see that. But as far as the demographics go, uh, uh, I think the good news on the demographics, and I think this is important to mention, is that young people today, I think, are the most entrepreneurial generation in my lifetime, because I think they saw the uh, housing bubble bursting. Uh, they were probably too young to see the dot-com bubble bursting, but they saw a lot of pain in the housing bubble bursting, and therefore they don't want to be get trapped in, in, a, in a job that may disappear on them or the company go out of business, so they want to use whatever skills they learn to become entrepreneurs. And you don't have to be an undergraduate business student to be an entrepreneur. Students are going online and doing all sorts of wonderful things and meeting people's needs. And that's what it comes down to, Doug. Are you providing something of value to the consuming public? And if you can do that, you're gonna do well in our economy because uh, there are, as far as I can tell, no barriers to entry to open up an online business. And it's pretty seamless for someone to go online literally in, in 24 hours and um, and have a business going where they can generate revenue. So this is the wonderful thing about the free enterprise economy. And I just wish the politicians understood that so they could leave people alone to, to, to do great things for, for the general public. Now, now, you may remember, Marie, we swiped the battery out of your crystal ball, but I want to ask you another question about the future. As you look into the future, how different Will U.S. business be in 20, give me a 20 years from now, let's say? Uh, I, I wish I had uh, a very clear crystal ball on that. All I know is, given the history of the U.S. economy, from the beginning of the Republic to the present, every generation has had huge technological breakthroughs. I think that's clear. And we're seeing this in artificial intelligence. We're seeing this in biotech. We're seeing it in transportation to a certain degree with... Um, electric cars and self-driving cars. I was seeing it in a whole host of retailing, e-commerce. Look at this, look at the e-commerce. It's gone from nothing 20, 25 years ago to I think what, 20% of the economy today and expect, and it accelerated during uh, the lockdowns that we had last year. So I am optimistic just as Warren Buffett made that point uh, in one of his letters uh, to the shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway that uh, this, the US economy is, is, is a, a great engine of prosperity. 
And my concern is that sometimes that engine sputters because of the policies enacted in Washington, D.C., which interfere with the natural, if you will, uh, economy where people save and invest and invent and innovate. And that, that's, that's been the history of the U.S. economy, but we've also had these banking panics in the 19th century. And, the, and, and since the Federal Reserve was created, we've had these terrible depressions uh, going back to um, the Forgotten Depression of 1920, 21, and of course the Great Depression, which lasted a full decade, which was unheard of in American economic history. So uh, could we have another period like that? I tend to doubt it. My concern is that, um, and since I started learning about this back in the 70s, the key to the US economy not imploding in a way that would be horrific for the 330 million Americans is foreigners decide to dump dollars. That would mean that it's checkmate for the US dollar, that uh, the dollar would implode in value, which by the way, is what we had in 1979, 1980, when we had the double digit inflation under uh, Carter and Volcker came in to stop that uh, double digit inflation with this tight money and high interest rate policy. We were very close to a total meltdown of the US dollar in the late 70s, early 80s. Remember the price of gold doubled, virtually doubled in like six months which means that there was a flight out of the dollar into hard assets because people had very little confidence in the future of the dollar because of the double digit inflation. Remember, China was not a factor back then. It was basically the Europeans, the Japanese that had hold, held dollars. And so uh, we came very close. Uh, we went to the cliff and uh, withdrew from it. And since then, uh, the US has enjoyed, I think, a relatively decent economy since 1980. Uh, but uh, here's the other important point. Since the Great Recession and all the money creation, all the quantity easing by the Federal Reserve, we've had the most tepid 10-year period, in I think, in U.S. economic history of economic growth since 2009. And so that's an interesting statistic that no one really talks about, is that the U.S. economy has not reached its potential because of all the cheap money, not in spite of the cheap money, because of the cheap money and the regulations during the Obama administration and all the other things that were thrown at the uh, market economy, uh, trade regulations, what have you. So again, uh, I come from the school of thought that says, leave the economy alone, leave the men and women who create wonderful things for the public and things will be work out extremely well. Murray, would you tell our listeners and viewers once again, the name of your book? It's called Navigating the Boom Bust Cycle. If you go to my blog, murraysabrin.com, there's a flyer uh, that links you to the publisher and the publisher is offering a 20% discount. There's a code you can get on that flyer. And the publisher is very excited about this book because of all the reviews we've gotten before the book was published, since the book was published because the book is a very practical um, uh, guide, if you will, to how to improve your business and maintain your business if we have a, a huge decline in the economy. There's another fact that I came across in doing the research that I think you'll find interesting. What's Every that? Every year since 1920, ending in zero, has been a recession except 2010, where it came early in 2008, 2009. So if we extrapolate that phenomenon for the past 100 years, it means we could have a major economic downturn in 2030. How is that for that crystal ball? Uh, well, so I, I think I would return the crystal ball to uh, the store where I bought it if that were the case. <laughs> so, so how, in your opinion, can we uh, stop this boom-bust business cycle? Yeah, I think the Federal Reserve should do what it was initially intended to do when it was created. It was, it was created to be a lender of last resort for the banks, which I don't think is necessary because the banks have their own problems. As you know, Doug, they have a flawed business model. That's why we had banking panics in the 19th century. They borrow short and lend long, which means there's a mismatch of their maturities. Their maturities are short term, which means people can get their money out quickly and on demand, if you will. But they have loans, which are, be, which are term loans, one year, three year, five years, whatever. And so when the economy goes sour, uh, people get nervous and withdraw their money in the 19th century is because the banks were inflating and they didn't have enough gold or silver in reserves to back up their notes that they were issuing to the public. So when the Federal Reserve was created, their charge after the panic of 1907, the Fed was created in 1913, was to smooth out the business cycle. Well, that certainly didn't happen. So they failed on that count. They also was, were, was charged to maintain the purchasing power of the dollar. That hasn't happened because the dollar has lost more than 95% of its value since the Federal Reserve was created, what they've done is backstop the banking system by 
providing them with loans or grants in order to make sure they don't go under. So from my perspective, all the Federal Reserve should do is clear checks and make sure there's no financial fraud in the financial system. That's all they should do. They should leave money. Uh, well, the old days, we had the gold standard. There wasn't a 100% gold standard, but it was a, a gold standard that people had trust in the currency. And therefore, people were not worried that the dollar would be inflated and their purchasing power would go down. And uh, they realized that uh, if the banks were honest and didn't issue more currency than they had res uh, gold reserves, they could get their money out without a problem. So we need to go back to what's tried and true, what works, which is, quote, sound money. Don't inflate the currency. Naturally, the money supply increases through gold discoveries. That's a, a long expensive process, which means the gold supply increases very incrementally to the current gold supply, and therefore prices will not go up. In fact, the beauty of the last third of the 19th century under the semi-gold standard, the classical gold standard that we had, is prices were falling, which meant that the real wages were going up. If your wages stayed the same and prices are going down 2-3% a year, that means your real income is going up 2-3% a year. Right now, We've got 6.8% inflation year over year. Most people's wages didn't keep up with that. And to add insult to injury, Doug, we're getting zero on our savings accounts, CDs and money market accounts. That means we're losing roughly 6% a year in purchasing power by keeping money in the bank. So the Federal Reserve really has harmed the American people to the tune of, from what I recently read, $4 trillion of savers interest has been gone because of the low interest rate policy of the Federal Reserve, thinking that would be the way to boost the economy. And so what they've given us is another gigantic bubble. And if I'm right, the bubble is going to burst maybe in a couple of years. And uh, we could have another big bubble at the end of this decade. So uh, that's why this book, I think, is an in indispensable guide for uh, young entrepreneurs and uh, business decision makers. Well, one last question from me, and that is, as you look globally, is there any country's economy that you think is close to where you would like to see it? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, uh, that would take a lot of research because uh, all the central banks are inflating. I mean, I mean, the dollar right now is relatively strong. So we're sort of the, uh, the uh, least ugly of, of the ugly currencies that are out there. And uh, this is the history of, of the uh, last hundred years central banks have been ruling their economies with uh, paper money, with uh, fiat money. So, now, Switzerland is supposed to have a, a good sound money uh, uh, philosophy. I, again, I haven't looked at the Swiss data recently. Hong Kong was supposed to have a pretty good uh, philosophy about uh, sound money. So again, uh, I would have to take a look, a deep dive into the data to see which countries are doing better. But right now, Europe is, is in, in is bad shape. They're in, they have, they have uh, negative interest rates. Which, which is mind boggling when you think about it. It violates every principle I've been teaching. For, I taught for 35 years about corporate finance that interest rates are supposed to be positive and real, and you just have a real return on your savings. And, and, uh, and, and you don't have that in many countries around the world. That's why I think they're floundering to, to a large degree. And the central bank is trying to dial up what's the best formula to uh, get their economies moving. And uh, it's all counterproductive. That, the bottom line is they don't achieve the objective that they want, which is sustainable prosperity, if in fact that's their objective. If that's a, their objective, they failed miserably. I think I've given you an idea for another book. <laughs> well, I'm writing my fourth book in four years. I think I need to take a time out to uh, digest everything I've done and uh, be on programs like this. So I really appreciate the opportunity to really educate the American people, since that's my field of uh, for, for 35 years, is educating youngsters about the uh, the economy, the finance, the business cycle, having taught the financial history of the United States, a wonderful course for students. They absolutely love that course because they learn things they never learned in any other course, whether it's a history course or economics course or a finance course. So I put it all together going back to the days of the uh, colonial period up until the present day. So it was a real survey course over 15 weeks about how the US financial system unfolded and what were the impacts on the economy. You've been watching the Biz News Podcast. We welcome your input. Send your email to editor at biznews.com. Thanks for watching.